thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon for our last workshop. Uh, I will do a little bit of the EDI and EDI fund background and then uh, hand it over to Michael to talk about the specifics of the this RFP. Michael, next. So the equitable development initiative is about four years old and it started about five years ago with an equity analysis as the companion for the comprehensive plan update. Uh, and usually we're required to do an EIS or environmental impact statement, but this was the first time in any city to have an equity analysis. Uh, the equity analysis uh, produced uh, some analysis that uh, was showing no matter which growth strategy the city was going to go with, there was going to be impact, specifically impact in uh, neighborhoods that had high uh, marginalized communities. The equity analysis was followed by a race and social equity goals and policies in the comprehensive plan. Every, uh, every element of the comprehensive plan from housing, to climate, uh, to community involvement had uh, race and social equity goals. The policy link helped the city. Uh, and then uh, that was followed by an equitable development implementation plan, uh, and then followed by an equitable development financial strategy and a fund for community driven projects that we're gonna talk about later. Next. So it's important to talk about the EDI origin story and in 2012 uh, not 2012 about 2015 south coast south communities organizing for racial regional equity i think uh, i don't know who right now in this group is either part of uh, south core or reset i didn't hear an individual came together to uh you know uh really put equity in the comprehensive plan at the time. They just had one line saying that let's infuse equity in the comprehensive plan. And the Race and Social Equity Task Force uh, was formed across neighborhoods uh, in predominantly central area, Chinatown, uh, Othello and Rainier Valley. All of them had, they were dealing with the same impacts in their communities and came together to advocate for the implementation plan, inform the and, uh, financial strategy, and then uh, inform the policy links uh, report. And South Core is about 21 organization in Rainier Valley too, who organized around that. Next. So a lot of uh, in development programs or initiatives are normally uh, not values-based. Uh, equitable development initiative is values-based. And these are the uh, about seven values that was co-created by the advisory board. And, uh, and, and we start with acknowledging historic injustices and support efforts, which are explicit about addressing systemic racism and the institutional barriers that exist in communities of color. We value uh, and focus decision-making processes into structures of community development with clear accountability to impacted community members, centering communities most impacted by displacement and growth. Uh, we are value-based around community-driven strategies and believe in community self-determination, influence and leadership, and know that communities are resilient and resourceful and tapping into their own collective cultural stones, uh, curbs displacement. And then we have a value around accountability and uh, support efforts which are most likely to bring in improvements to those impacted by displacement and lack of opportunity. And we also recognize that affected communities deserve strong, accountable, accessible, and transparent and culturally appropriate solutions that includes ongoing oversight government and other entities to address the negative imp impacts that they have experienced. And we also uh, have a value around flexibility and interdependence. Um, and here we strive to create processes that reduce barriers to participation while providing a fair structure to all communities seeking to participate in the equitable development initiative. 
And then I skipped leverage. We support efforts that leverage community resources and support the existing assets available to low income communities. The EDI has six equity drivers, one of which is on the local cultural assets of the communities most impacted. And finally, we believe in systemic change and both external, uh, especially focusing on internal systemic change. And as far as the EDI funding is concerned, it's intended to advance projects that are reimagining the development process in a way that prioritizes the long-term benefits and capacity for community members. Next. So this is a map from uh, the 1930 redlining where it just states that uh, investment decisions that were made by previous generations contributed to the inequities communities experience today. So we see that the areas that were graded best and still desirable, uh, areas that have high access to opportunity, and the areas that uh, suffered from widespread disinvestments and racialized policies and were actually uh, graded as definitely declining and hazardous also are areas right now that have uh, a lot of the marginalized communities, areas that right now are showing as uh, high risk displacement and low access to opportunity. Next, Michael. So when we show the redlining map from 1930, we normally follow it with these two maps from four years ago that came with the equity analysis that I mentioned earlier, uh, which shows the risk of displacement and access to opportunity. And if you uh, saw the redlining map, those areas that were <laughs> Hazardous and definitely declining were the areas that have high risk of displacement, uh, as you can see on this map from four years ago. And these are also neighborhoods that are known for their density of people of color. On my right, which might be on your left, you see the access to opportunity map that shows uh, neighborhoods that are in mostly the south of Ship, Ship Canal. Again, on the redlining maps are the same neighborhoods that you know, uh, in um, graded uh, hazardous or definitely declining, uh, those same neighborhoods that don't have access to opportunity. Uh, there is some exceptions in those neighborhoods like Central Area and Chinatown because of their proximity to downtown and jobs. But then again, the question we ask here is who has access to those jobs? Are those the communities have access to those jobs or are we getting and jo uh, these jobs filled by other folks from even other countries and things like that? Next. A lot of times people ask us to show an example of the layers in the equity analysis. And these are two that we show the proximity to regional, regional job center. Again, you see the travel time to designated King County urban centers and manufacturing and industrial centers in minutes. The areas that are blue are areas that you have, you actually travel to those areas in less than five minutes. And then uh, some areas you have more than um, 60 to 20 minutes is when it takes you to travel to those, um, to the regional job centers. On the right uh, is another layer around household income, showing percentage of the population with income below 200% of the federal poverty level. Again, if you remember the other map that I showed uh, in around access to opportunity, you can see how the layer here where the percentage of population that are between 31% to 35% or over 40%, uh, again, those areas that have low access to opportunity and their household income uh, shows that. Next. So those were maps. I'm not a planner, so I like seeing things described in other ways. So our equitable development based targeted strategy will prioritize neighborhoods that have high levels of chronic and recent displacement risk, who have historically a history of racially driven disinvestments, have significant population of marginalized communities, and we define marginalized communities as actually communities that, you know, right now what people are calling BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, people of color, who are also low income. These neighborhoods also had community-driven uh, strategies 
created through inclusive community engagement. I talked about a building on local cultural assets of those communities. How are we seeing with what these neighborhoods and communities are doing in their neighborhoods from an asset-based perspective? And then uh, finally, a lot of these neighborhoods got major transportation investments and they're not benefiting from that investment. Like, for example, the South communities uh, that I talked about earlier came together to be a voice for community controls and uh, around when the when the light rail came in. Next. So the equitable development initiative has the dual purpose of mitigating displacement and increasing access to opportunities and strategies to achieve community stability, stability and resilience in the face of displacement. And right now with this framework, we are seeing that um, the COVID impacts actually, we see economic mobility being impacted, you know, an opportunity being impacted. We're seeing people being displaced both from the residents and both from cultural uh, commercial displacement, small businesses going out of business, you know, and bringing up that building on the local cultural assets of those communities are important for us. I think somebody right now had introduced themselves by like they, they, they were um, from the COVID uh, mutual groups that stepped up, right, when government and other philanthropy were taking their time to come up with criteria and things like this. This type of groups that uh, were rooted in those neighborhoods or those uh, communities came, stepped up and started, uh, you know, uh, helping the groups and uh, residents that were impacted. For us, each of the equitable development grantees brings at least three equity drivers together in one project. We just don't look for a project that just does economic mobility, for example, or just residential displacement, but at least they are supposed to show that they're bringing at least three of these equity drivers in one project. Next, Michael. And then another important aspect for uh, EDI is like reframing how we talk about working with communities most impacted from like we are helping these communities to like we're working together to advance equitable outcomes. So that's another really important uh, EDI uh, theory of change. Next. And then, you know, this year we have $5.8 million available from the EDI fund. And then another important aspect for us is how are we making sure that we are also shifting our language from managing risks to like we have to try, we have to work and partner with these communities to come up with solutions or they already have the solutions. How do we invest and support those solutions is one other aspect and key value that EDI brings in. And I think Michael's going to take it from here. Yep. All right. I muted myself. Millennial credentials. Uh, that's good. Uh, so, you know, this is where we sort of pivot from how to think and understand EDI as a program to talking a little bit more about the specifics of the RFP um, and trying to help answer questions about how to go about applying for funds for this year. So all of the values and history that U Uba talked about really condenses in a lot into sort of core criteria that are, no matter what EDI is doing, these are gonna be things that, that we as a program and, and our, all of our partners are constantly centering. And so the, the focus on high risk of displacement communities and ties to the displacement risk maps that, that we looked at earlier. Um, the depth of relationship from the project sponsor is really a criteria about, you know, who is who are the people authentically doing the work and are we actually centering those who are most impacted in the decision making and the way that um, the grant dollars flow th into community. And then the equity drivers are aligning with the equity drivers that we just talked about. Um, and making sure that um, what we're working on are real community development projects and we're not just funding a functional area of somebody who says, you know, I just want to do housing and I'm going to say that that is an anti-displacement strategy. Housing clearly, affordable housing clearly is an anti-displacement strategy, but there are sort of other programs and, and we're 
there are ways to think about affordable housing that are from the programmatic housing aspect, and there's ways to think about affordable housing from the community development aspect. And so we really challenge people working with us to think about these things from the community development side and how does the thing that you're working on interact with the other aspects or the complicated nature of community and you know people are multifaceted and their needs are multifaceted and so how are we in having a deeper level of conversation about the work that's being done um there are always other um criteria that that are important to us certainly geographic distribution is one of them and you know we're citywide programming so make sh making sure that we're not leaving uh, some areas behind um because you know there's just less attention or there's less activity and and we look around and we're like oh we have never funded any work in that neighborhood so you know we try to be mindful of of that and making sure that there are folks who have access um even if there may not be the same level of depth of nonprofits or organizations working in, in certain areas. Um, unmet need is a big one. Uba talked about leverage. And so, you know, the EDI is relatively small. I mean, it's those are big numbers, the 5.8 million that we're talking about. But in the grand scheme of things, you know, we have we try to be really thoughtful about how we're interacting with systems to help reduce a barrier or break through a barrier or, or help a uh, organization or a project advance to the next stage of whatever that we're doing. And so sometimes, you know, that means you know, resourcing something very conceptual um, because nobody else is doing that and nobody else wants to take the risk with somebody. Um, and so we try to we try to find creative ways to do that. Um, but that also means that we we historically have steered away from simply trying to duplicate what another program is doing from some other, you know, whether it's another city department or some other funding agency. Um, and lastly, again, in part because the, the EDI was born from a comprehensive planning process and we're housed in the long range planning <laughs> office in the city, you know, a lot of what we think about is how, how are we seeding relationships and, and capacity being built to do long-term change and whether that's organizing work or whether that's you know establishing a plan that will help community weather um all of the things we're weathering now or in the good times you know investment and gentrification and displacement that occur from in you know market forces and so really thinking about the future impacts of things and what we're doing now to help prepare for things that are coming down the road uh, so here's one of the examples of kind of the core criteria, and these are in the RFP guidelines. Um, so, you know, if you if you download those from the, the application website, um, you'll you'll see all this in that packet. And so this is just a sort of an example that we provide. And this is used by the reviewers who look at the applications, and it's supposed to be a guide for those writing as well to sort of say, you know, how do you what's what's a way to sort of make it a little more concrete what these sort of large you know values and, and concepts are and so this is sort of one of the examples and where we're trying to tease out you know who is this organization and how are they answering these questions to show that they're authentically rooted in community and are, and are bringing an idea that's initiated by community members who are impacted by that issue and not um not nonprofits who are sort of like, oh, like we do this thing and let's go look around the city and find a place to do it in. But that but that idea isn't actually specifically rooted in the needs or the the assets or the strengths that the community already has. Um, so this is this is the depth of relationship example. Another one again is that's very important is the equity drivers. And you know this one is a a little complicated too because the equity, you know, you can look at the equity drivers and say, well, how is this $50,000 grant possibly gonna affect displacement in the city of Seattle? And how am I gonna have a measurable outcome about that in a, in a year of work? And so, you know, we try to use this more to say, you know, are you thinking about this in a way where there will be tangible impact for people? And so, you know, this isn't, you know, we're all absolutely open to creativity and want to encourage that, but we also do want to 
um, be mindful that what we're we're talking about here is stewardship of resources to people who need it. And so, you know, a lot of these displacement has been a crisis for a long time, right? And you know, if you look at the central area for since the 70s, the the, the black population there has been displaced. So, you know, how do, how are we doing things that are actually potentially going to make a difference? And how are we keeping those needs in mind as we're trying to put this together? Um, and also, again, the, the, the importance of the three equity drivers is to make sure that we're, we're thinking holistically about how we relate to community and how the idea relates to community. So a little bit about the background of where our funding has come from. The initial seed money for the program came from the sale of the Civic Square block, which is the city block right by the Pioneer Square station. That's a big hole in the ground that was city property. It was sold off to a developer. And, and so we, in the first two years of operation, we used that money to get it started. Um, community Development Block Grant, the CDBG, there is a federal program. So we get a small amount of money through that. It's incredibly difficult to use and j almost always costs more to comply with the rules than it does um, than we have to give out. So we tend to be pretty um, flexible and creative with how we're using it um, to make sure that it's a good fit regulatory and, and we're not setting somebody up to say, well, we gave you this award, but now we've given you 10 years of misery as a you know, as the, the cost of that. Um, starting last year with the passage of the short-term rental tax, which is the Airbnb tax, um, we've been we've been slated to get $5 million a year. Sort of the first $5 million that comes from that tax is supposed to fund the program this year because there's very little revenue actually being generated from sh short-term rentals. Nobody's going anywhere, so nobody's using our Airbnbs. Um, council and the mayor backfilled us with general fund revenue. And then uh, last year, there was also the sale of another surplus property called the Mercer Mega Block that's in South Lake Union. Um, that money, we created a separate program that is was specifically around helping projects that were in our pipeline uh, acquire sites. Because what we were finding was we were making awards for people to buy property um, but we were capping the awards at a million dollars, which as folks know in Seattle, if you're doing any sort of development that's more than buying a house, a million dollars doesn't get you very far. And so we really needed to create a, a specific program to help bridge that gap and make sure that folks were acquiring property and not losing sites. Cause we were watching, you know, our partners go after site one after another and not be able to, to close the deal. And so this year, again, we're, we're backfilled with the $5 million. Um, we'll talk about how that's getting distributed. Um, the, the additional 0.8 there is some extra CDBG that we've tried to apply in other places and had to, to pull back out. Um, and uh, there's a big shift. So a lot of what I was talking about before was very real estate focused. And that's, you know, the orientation of the, pro the program has always been a very real estate focused program around acquiring land, helping develop community ownership of the space in the neighborhoods that folks are operating in. And this year we had a real pivot. When when COVID came in, you know, we we started asking what's the what's the most important thing we could be doing this year? And is it doing the same thing we've done before or should we we come up with a new strategy? And what we heard from basically everybody was, this is going to be a terrible year. This was in February, so little did we know. But <laughs> um, we, we really need help. We need support. We need to be flexible and just get some dollars out in community in a way that helps folks stabilize and provide services in creative and flexible ways and just meet the community where they're at. And so we, we really made a pivot this year to um, these much smaller grants um, hopefully, we'll be, we'll be doing a lot more of them. Usually, we would only bring in seven to ten new projects, um, but we're going to hopefully do 40 or so grants this year. And the idea is, is a really a range of stuff and, and, and pretty low bar about what is eligible conceptually. So that could be direct community support. If, if you all are looking around and you're saying, you know, this thing is not, you know, there's people in my, my neighborhood and in my community that are not getting what they need and and it's really affecting folks how can you know like what's the, what's how do we 
how do we meet that need, right? If, if, no, if nobody else is doing it, what's the idea? Um, but this could also be, you know, we as an organization are looking at these challenges and if we don't build some infrastructure for ourselves for how to do the work and keep track of things, we're not going to be able to, to meet that need. And so even if there are resources out there, we can't take advantage of them. And so we need to invest in ourselves to be able to access some of these other resources. Or to, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on and we're, you know, we're managing the crisis at the moment to the degree that we can, but there were all these things that we know we need to do. And this could be, you know, when we talk about disaster gentrification, we're talking about, you know, having seen in, in 2008 and 2009 when that downturn happened and the way that speculative money came into low income communities and started buying property and the slow role that that effect that had and how hard it is to intervene after property has transitioned. And so can we work with folks creatively to come up with strategies now that may be able to intervene earlier in that process and prevent some of the loss of, of community assets, uh, you know, five or six years down the road when we realize what's happened. So the, the funding is spread in a couple different ways. So we've, we have about 25 projects in our existing pipeline. And one of the things that we talked about when we were saying, what is, you know, how do we help everybody get through is what does it mean that we're in relationship? You know, when, when fo we work with folks, we've, we've always said, you know, we're building a partnership for a while, right? And we're, we're, our success is shared. And so part of the answer to us this year was, let's just make sure that we're not putting folks in a t position where they were using EDI funding to build their capacity and make sure they were op able to operate. And then we're gonna yank the funding out in the middle of all these crises. And so we kind of said, let's set aside some money to just make sure they're okay. And they, they don't, all the stuff that we've been working on doesn't fall apart. And we also, the reason that number is, is larger is there was also, there's some projects that we've been working on that are, running about to run up in, against some pretty specific and unmovable deadlines around how their projects are going and so we set aside some money to say okay we know that everybody else's other funders are pivoting too your capital campaigns are getting harder but if we don't make this deadline everything falls apart again so we wanted to make sure that we had a little bit there um, and it's capital funding. So when I say little, it's, it turns out to be a lot of money to, of the overall fund. But um, again, the, the focus on the existing organizations is just to make sure that we're not losing ground with all the work that we've been doing with folks in the, and we're maintaining the relationship and partnerships that we've committed to. Uh, so this RFP is really concentrated on this new partnerships. And, and sort of the trade-off was we said, you know, the existing organizations, we're, we're doing all these things to, to help, but you guys cannot apply for the new partnerships. And so we really said, okay, this is really about the new folks who are out there who didn't have access, either they applied before and we were too competitive and we ran out of money, or, you know, you're not doing capital projects and, and this is really service oriented or other kinds of things that weren't a good fit. And so, you know, this is, this is really for, for all of you who are, saying, okay, like we got some work to do in our communities and how can we access this without having to compete with other organizations that had already been accepted into the fund. And then there are a couple other things that we pulled out a little bit of money for. The Office of Sustainability and Environment has an environmental justice grant. And one of, when we had originally been talking about that, some of the, you know, COVID obviously has a lot of health equity impacts and we, we decided that rather than having EDI create a duplicative structure, um, we could just partner with them and, and have people only have to go through one process and access funds through EJC. So that, pro that funding cycle is open now. They started a little sooner, so I think they may be closing pretty soon. Um, the, there should be a link on our website and in the RFP guidelines for that as well to access that application. And we just added some money into their program and, and said, you, you're, you, you're aligned with our values and our priorities. Um, and let's just try to make this easier for folks rather than having two different government programs that people have to write grants to. 
And then the Seattle Together Partnership, UBA can talk a little bit more about this if there are questions, but it's sort of an interdepartmental program that the city put together in response to COVID around um, helping with sort of civic togetherness and, you know, helping folks in community sort of remain connected to each other. Um, so I'm not as familiar with all the work they're doing, but UBA sits on that, that table if folks have questions about the kind of things that those that funding is going for. So within that 1.75 million bucket, there's sort of, we broke out um, three priority areas that there are, there is obviously some overlap to all of these things, again, because community is multifaceted and complex, but we tried to um, create a way to, to help folks distinguish a little bit. And so, you know, BIPOC social infrastructure is really in, in many ways a response to the Black Lives Matter organizing and movement that's been happening. Um, but also, you know, there's questions of indigenous sovereignty and um, lots of um, impacts to the Asian American community and the API community around COVID and the xenophobia that was created from that. So, so this was funding that was really trying to, to make sure that we were mindful that that was, you know, COVID is one of the major issues we're facing and the economic downturn is one of the major issues, but um, there's been so much di disparity in the, those impacts um, and, you know, the xenophobia that's come from that and the, the discrimination that's come from that has been borne by people of color. And so, so how, how are we making sure that we're setting aside a, some funding or a priority to help help those organizations or or the folks who are working on green disaster gentrification. Again, it is a little more focused on on the economic impacts of you know the recession and also you know highlighting a bit the forward thinking. You know, how do we not make the same mistakes we did? last year. And so what are the creative strategies that people are working on to help protect community if there's a recovery and it starts pushing in a way that is inequitable in the way that recovery happens and community assets are re-endangered. And then the COVID-19 community response and recovery again is, is can carry a range of topics, but the focus is a little bit more on how do we all, you know, again, how do we keep community healthy and make it through the year? And what what do folks need in the immediate short term to to get through and, and help their communities with the things that, that people are hurting for? And so the, the timeline, we're obviously in the thick of things. This is the um, last webinar that we have. Um, we've been really scrunching down the timeline to try to make sure that we can make awards by the end of the year. Um, so, you know, the applications are due next week. And then the way that EDI reviews applications is we convene um, impacted community members who have experience with the issues that are, that are a topic area. And so one of the things that that requires is we make sure that we're not having people review their own applications. And so we have to wait until all the applications are in to um, ask people to, to participate on the grant review to make sure that there's no conflicts of interest and we know and we're not you know recruiting folks who then they have to step out because they ended up being connected to one of the applications but we're hoping that we can do that pretty quickly again the, the, there's that range there because that's us moving as quickly as we can while understanding that people's schedules are complex and, and we haven't had a chance to be able to lock in those dates because we don't know who we're locking those dates in with um, and then after those decisions are made, there's an internal city process that has to go through to get final approval. That is not super in our control. Lots of things happen that are emergencies that, that take bandwidth from the decision makers. Um, but we're really pushing to have that decision done by, by Thanksgiving. And so, you know, the idea being that folks have a little bit of time to digest that they got the awards and then we can really run right into the contracting process and try to get money moving as early in, in 2021 as possible. And, you know, we talk a lot of, we've talked a lot about partnership and what it means to be working together. Um, this one is going to be a little different where the expectation is really that these are, um, these are one-off contracts and, and we're not really sure, we'll, you know, we'll probably pivot a little bit in 2021 
Um, we don't know what the budget, the city's budget looks like, so we don't know how much money we're even talking about. Um, but assuming that we have an RFP, we'll have to kind of make an assessment after the budget about how that would work. But you know, we've never been set up to do these small grants or, or continue, carry this work for a long period of time. So we're really assuming these are one-offs and, and there will be a discussion sort of with the larger community um, as we ramp up for the next RFP about what the priorities are. And, you know, we may be on the, you know, there's questions about when the vaccine will come out. You know, there's so, there's so many things that we just wanna be mindful of not setting a strategy too early. Um, so that we can, again, if, if we need to do something new or, or different to, to best meet the needs of folks, um, we're gonna try to do that in 2021 as well. Uh, so that's the, the formal presentation. You should all be able to either unmute yourself or wave your arms wildly and I will unmute you. Um, also feel free to use the chat box um, and I will do my best to um, read out those questions um, and answer them. And again, this, this call is, or, or this webinar is being recorded. So um, if you, I said something and then you kind of missed all of it, there's an opportunity to go back and listen to you. But um, Uba, do you have any other things to, to add before we turn it over to questions? No, just waiting for questions. <laughs> the people are not in cam in, on camera, so you can't see them waving, but feel free Yeah, only, to only a few people <laughs> can wave. <laughs> Feel free to unmute yourselves. This is a shy group. Michael, do you have some of the questions we got from the other uh, and the responses? I think there was a question around capital, if we're investing in new capital partnerships. Sure, sure, I can talk about that. And also, you know, if, if you don't want to ask questions in the, in the group, um, but or if something comes up later, um, uh, you sh I'll put my email in the chat box as well, but feel free to reach out to me via email. Um, Obviously, as soon as I, a lot of things come up when you start writing, um, and so we don't want to we don't want to close the door on that. So if if folks um, if folks have that or have questions that come up later, um, feel free to reach out. Uh, the the question about capital is you know related to you know there were a lot of folks who were expecting us to be a capital funder again this year um, who have been somewhat alarmed by the pivot. And so, you know, our assumption has been that $50,000 isn't going to get you very far in a capital campaign. Um, we're not opposed to that being a use of the funds if um, it's really clear that it's going to be, it's going to be useful for something. Uh, you know, we're, in general, in the past, we've been very open and intentional about being a first in funder with capital projects and expecting to sit with make the award and then have folks use that award to get other funding from folks and have sort of have their project have more gravitas. Um, this time, you know, the expectation is we want to get money out the door. And so, you know, it's it, we're not we're not trying to give out $50,000 awards to a capital campaign that then isn't spent in three years. And so so there is that change. But if it's we're at the end of our capital campaign and we need and this $50,000 will make the difference. Um, absolutely, that's, that's, there's no, we don't have a prohibition about that. And certainly if you said we're using this to start a capital campaign, that's, that's different, right? Because you'd be spending the money this year. Um, there's a question in the chat about how do I view the webinar if I came in late? So, um, all of our webinars are getting recorded. And so on our website, there's a link to all of them. And if you click on... All, the first three should already be switched over to being the recording. And so this one, hopefully by Friday, we'll have, we'll have up. Um, they're all kind of similar. And I, I'm going to take a stab at, now that this is over, doing a frequently asked questions and getting it up there. Um, 
but I've not been doing a good job of talking and writing questions down when people ask me verbally. So um, we're going to do our best to try and get something up, but you should be able to listen to all four if you um, want to. Um, and again, feel free to, free, if there's a specific question, feel free to, to ask me um, through my email. And I'm so far doing pretty good about getting back to you. Although if you wait till the 22nd, um, <laughs> I can't promise anything. Hi, this is Kiki. I have a question about um, <clears throat> what the funding could be used for. I see that you say the funding is not intended to replace existing funding opportunities um, between services. Um, but I'm curious about the, um, well, the COVID impact on our community specific, the biggest impact has been around housing. Would we be able mm -hmm. to use a fund like this to provide housing rental assistance and emergency housing for folks impacted uh, from our community, which is primarily black, indigenous and people of color impacted by incarceration? Sure. So, so, and I will admit that this can be frustrating for people who are writing grants for us, and, and we we struggle with this every year about how to do this. And so, we we've set up the program to be very open about what we can and can't do, and not to have a lot of rules that say, you know, you can't provide this. And so, if you were if you awarded funding and you said this is what we want to do with it, we'd absolutely be able to work with you on that. I think the question that you'll want to answer is you know, the reviewers will be looking at a lot of applications and trying to help distinguish which ones get funded and they don't have an easy job. And so I think the challenge in that case would be to look at the landscape of programs that are doing rental assistance, whether it's, you know, the United Ways program or the, the King County program that launched um, and say, you know, those are great, but they're not meeting the need that we have. And so here is, you know, we need this to do this thing that that nobody else is, is really serving very well, and then I think you 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 can you can make a pretty strong case. But if it's you know we're basically doing what those programs are doing, it, that that may be more of a challenge for the reviewers if they're if they're looking at something that where there clearly is an unmet need and, and something that on its surface appears more duplicative. So it's you know it's really about how how to best make the case for that. Um, as being a, as being a priority, given all the other things that folks have to weigh, and you know, we're, we again the the purpose of us having the smaller grants this year was to be able to serve a lot more and and not be quite as competitive as we are. But we also yeah. that might also mean that we just have a vastly higher number of applications coming in, and so as a percentage of what we're able to fund it. You know, we we don't know. This is this is kind of new territory for us too, a bit. Okay, because it sounds pretty broad as far as um, it's not just focusing on community organizing and systems change kind of work, but it sounds like there is also the space for um, emergency impact, uh, financial, um, direct service kind of resources there. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. I yeah, mean, we talked about the direct support. Yeah. Yeah. So when we talked about the direct support and the COVID stuff, like that's really kind of making sure that that's part of the overall framework of what we're talking about is that kind of work. Okay. And then when you're talking about focusing on displacement strategies, um, that's really looking at how to keep folks within the Seattle city limits from having to move out of the city for economic reasons. And I apologize. It's a lot of language that I'm not really sure. sure yeah so you know the EDI is at its core an anti-displacement program right so that's what we were created and that's what the advocacy surrounding the comprehensive plan was about is how to you know how do we look at this legacy of um displacement and uh, you know the redlining maps and that the fact that they keep so closely to the risk of displacement now um and how do we center that in in interventions to Either if you know if there's investment and gentrification happening, is there a way to do that in a way that lifts up the the people who are living in those neighborhoods, or can we prevent some of the gentrification from happening while also creating the opportunities for people to invest in themselves? Um, so so 
you know, anti-displacement is is fundamentally one of the the core focuses we have, which is why, again, yeah. this this RFP is a little bit of a stretch for us too, um, in in opening this up a little more to different kinds of ideas or different kinds of programs that aren't as laser focused. Although, again, hopefully there's a tie-in um, in if we're not meeting the needs of people now and they have to leave or do whatever because they can't stay in Seattle, then that's also a displacement. So. I have a hope, question. Hope, uh, sure, go ahead. Ms. Preston Hampton. Um, you didn't get the second part of my question with the first time. It, so oh, when is the next RFP coming out? If somebody can't oh, make the deadline. Sure, sorry, uh, thanks. Um, so we're not, Sure. Um, this is all the money we have for this year. Um, we typically do them on an annual basis. Uh, the city's in a bit of a mess <laughs> with its budget. And so we're, you know, kicking around ideas, I would say, about what we would do in 2021 with the assumption that we will be doing something. Um, but we won't be able to really start having that conversation in earnest until the budget passes in late November. So we're kind of in a holding pattern too about what our timelines might be. Um, and, you know, as, as we sort of talked about at the beginning of this, um, you know, this whole RFP for us has been, you know, looking at talking to folks on the ground and saying, what is the moment we're in and what is the response that EDI could have? Um, and if that means us shifting into an area where we're less used to working, let's do that because that's the work that needs to be done and so it certainly seems like that conversation will also have to happen in, in november and and december and january um and that'll and you know hopefully that'll be a, a process that's very informed by community um to help set those priorities again and then you know once we know what we're going to do we'll try and move them well you know we'll try and get an rfp out as early as we can in the year so okay. Preston, to oh. like, yeah, uh, this is Uba. So even this RFP is late. We normally make decisions by now, and it's mm -hmm. normally for uh, projects, anti-displacement and uh, access to opportunity projects. This is like responsive to this moment, as as we talked about, and we w it, it got stuck with the budget uh, and kind of uh, balancing and things like that. That's why we do uh, like we're doing it right now, and people have only three about four weeks to respond to it. I just wanted to add that it's like, even though it's closing on the 23rd, it's a two page uh, LOI with like four questions, but also like, um, hopefully- LOI but, meaning something like- uh, Letter, letter of, intent. of intent, yeah. So okay. this is a really, yeah, if once you look at those questions and things like that, it's like a, in a four questions, two pages, uh, and we, we and we made sure that we don't make it bandersome to folks. Okay. Okay, the other question then back again to what is anti anti displacement. I mean, we're um, a low income housing organization and we're just uh, trying to increase our capacity. Is that is that fall within that uh, general category category of low income or excuse me, anti displacement? For the overall like EDI or this RFP in particular? This RFP. In yeah, so this RFP, yeah, there's three different buckets, like Michael mentioned. Might, might we go back to that? So looking at those three different buckets and see what are the, like, in uh, the, the social infrastructure, which is like the organizing and leadership development, and then the economic recovery and disaster gentrification. So I could see a low income organization that's working with people who are in, being evicted or are going to be displaced or, you know, like even a small business. Can, you can and, uh, apply to that economic recovery and disaster gentrification and also the COVID-19 community response and recovery. So uh, this is actually not only anti-displacement uh, in RFP, that's what I'm trying to say. You can pick from any of those or all of them and then- Okay, so this is not strictly cap um, capital? No. I, is it not at all capital? Yeah, it's not, a, this one is not at all capital. Some people- have, okay. uh, to use it for capital, but it's not capital at all. It's fifty thousand dollars for these three different things, or all three. An organization can apply for all three, or one of them that you see yourself doing and things like that. Our regular like uh, RFP is like capacity building to advance a capital project, and that's where this falls into. 
no, this is just, you know, it's not capital investments. It's capacity building to do any of these different buckets. Oh, to do any of these three different buckets. Yeah. It's capacity building in order to be able to to function in those areas, in any one of these three areas. Yeah, or all three. Some organizations might be doing all three and they might apply for all three, or you can see yourself in the BIPOC uh, social infrastructure, community organizing, leadership development, or mm. all three or two of them, yes. Up okay. to $50,000 per award. And uh, Michael said that we normally bring in up seven to 10 organizations for both capacity building and capital most of the time, but now this is just, we probably looking at 35 to 40 organizations at $50,000 per organization. Okay, thank you. Uh, and, and Uber brought up something and this came up in some of the other webinars. So I'll, um, I'll just jump in with, with this too, because there we've had some questions about the sort of the mechanics of applying for more than one priority area. And so the, the way that we've set this up is to try to give folks as many options as possible um, to where they see themselves in, in the guidelines. And so people could apply in each, each one for up to $50,000. And you can either use the same applicant, you know, the same narrative over and just route it to all three, or you could write a different two page LOI narrative for each one if you wanna customize it a little bit. And the way that we've structured the review process is that each of the priority areas will have its own sort of subcommittee of folks who are sort of aligned more with content experts, but yeah, up to 150 conceptually. And then each of those subgroups will then have one final meeting together where they will be able to look and say, well, are we all funding the same organization? Um, and is that what we wanted to do? Um, because that it may be that yes, <laughs> that is that makes a lot of sense, but it also may be that you know that happened a lot because certain people just sort of really nailed the writing and just sort of something about the way they did it clicked with everybody. But when we look at the the bigger picture of what we're funding, the values that Uba talked about in the beginning are getting lost, and so you know we're not you know certain areas or certain people are not just not getting funded or resourced at all. And so we've we've sort of built in a check and balance in our review process to give you all as applicants a lot of different options about how you would want to engage with us, um, potentially create a bunch of extra work for ourselves, um, but then have a way to to sort of get the recommendations and vet them one more time, looking at the bigger picture of the program and its potential impacts on the city. But hopefully that. Um, that's helpful and, and allows you as as potential applicants to to scale with what you're, you want your workload to be. 